Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Real Talk conversation about race, equity, and education. Uh, today, I am honored to have two very dear colleagues and friends from the Friends of the Children Network to join me. I invited them because in our first two Real Talks, um, we had some great conversations with one of our board members, Benjamin Carlton. We also invited the second one, we invited uh, my colleague from the Harlem and Bronx chapter, Gary Clemens, to join me. And this time, I wanted to make sure that people understood that the work that we all have to do when it comes to building a more equitable society is not just a black and white one. It has to be, it has to be a rainbow coalition of like-minded individuals who are fearless and shameless about fighting for change. And so today, I have joining me two wonderful individuals, first from Boston, leading our Boston chapter, Yi Chin Chin, um, bringing her perspective from the East Coast to bear with us here in Los Angeles, as well as across the country, and our, also our chief expansion officer from our national organization, uh, Aaron Kelly Seal, who has uh, also been a leader in a variety of capacities and so she's our Chief Officer of Expansion and Policy for the Friends of the Children Network. And so she supports all the chapters across the country around everything about growing our work, as well as figuring out what are some of the structural pieces we need to be identifying to help make our work more impactful. And so that's who I have for you today. And I'm really excited about this conversation that we're gonna to have together. And so, so kicking it off, I'm gonna ask Yi Chen to take a few minutes and share how she and the Boston chapter have been addressing issues of equity and education in Boston. And specifically, if you can, share a little bit about the history of divestment, uh, the school to prison pipeline and the dependency to delinquency pipeline that's been at play in Boston schools for many, many years. Yi Chen. Sure, thank you, Thomas, and, and welcome everybody. Um, I am um, you know, unju unusually nervous this afternoon. I'm not sure why. I think it's because, you know, we're talking about something that we're all very passionate about. But um, thanks, Thomas, for the introduction. I think, you know, in Boston, you can't talk about education equity without talking about the history of um, Boston and how it impacts everything that happens on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, in, in the Boston, in our city, really the education equity exists with a backdrop of a very traumatic racial history in Boston, you know, starting in the late 70s of forced desegregation through busing, and that then led to the white flight to the suburbs and years and years that follows of divestment in the public school education system. And um, what that actually looks like today are essentially schools that are concentrated with um, students with very high needs um, and schools that are inadequately funded to address the needs. And, um, and what it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, if you walk into a school classroom, everything that you see and everything that you hear and feel and touch sends a message to the kids that go to those schools that they're not worth investing in. And so that's the kind of uphill battle that um, we oftentimes find ourselves fighting on the front line of at Friends of the Children Boston. Um, as many of you guys know, Friends is, you know, a, a long-term um, model that selects children who um, can benefit from a, a having a really um, consistent, caring adult in, uh, by their sides for their entire childhood. And, um, and so we get to really walk that education journey with them. Um, on the day-to-day -day basis, our friends spend a lot of time in advocacy. So if you think about the way that the divestment happens on, you know, inside of the schools, you oftentimes are talking about kids that are um, receiving inadequate services because that don't have the resources to be able to get a high quality education. And so our friends spend a lot of time um, walking alongside their, um, the, the youth that they work with as well as the caregivers to make sure that they have a voice and that their voices are elevated. And sometimes when the doors are closed, our friends kick those doors open so our kids and the caregivers can walk in and advocate for themselves. Um, and another thing, a really, really important part of what our friends do on a day-to-day -day basis is also helping to change the narrative of the hopes and dreams of our kids. Oftentimes, you know, when 
you are trapped in the system that has been divested for so many generations, um, there's this narrative that has stuck. I have stuck for generations, and it's 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 deeply seeped in historical trauma. It's deeply seeped in in, in misconceptions about communities that we work with, and our friends through their daily work gets to paint and help our young people um, create a different narrative that they get to show the world. Um, we often hear our friends say, you know, through their work, their teachers get to see the talents of our kids and get to see the other side of the kids that is beyond what they typically see in the classroom. And if we can paint a different narrative and help our young people tell their own story, they get to live out their dreams and their hopes and get other people on board to support them, which I think is, you know, really a, a, a side of the work that we do at Friends of the Children that um, is, is incredibly important. Thank you for that, Yi Chin. Uh, Aaron, just pivoting over to you. Um, you've been doing work across the nation as well as leading major systems for quite some time. I'd love for you to share a little bit about your work and what's keeping you up at night. And, and, and as you think about this, provide some perspective from your vantage point since 2005 when you were serving as the leader of the child welfare system up in Portland, Oregon as well as your work within uh, Friends of the Children. Yeah, hi everybody. Thanks for the, the chance to, to learn and listen with you all today. Um, you know, I what's keeping me up at, right, up at night right now is, is just the hope that in these extraordinary circumstances that we're in, in these times of really significant challenge, that we don't miss the opportunity to reinvent the systems that we've been talking for years about being able to reinvent, reimagine, make more equal, should have a uh, have a stronger racial equity lens, and um, eliminate some of the the disparities and the issues of systemic oppression that they that persist. As Thomas mentioned, um, I had a chance to lead the child welfare system for the state of Oregon and then the Department of Human Services, and part of my tenure was during the last Great Recession. And during that time, I thought a lot about um, the quote from Milton Friedman, the economist that said only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. And he also said when the crisis occurs, the actions that are taken are usually the ones that are already lying around. Um, so it kind of provokes in me this question of what are some of the best and greatest ideas that our communities, that our practitioners, that our innovators that our youth and our families are telling us would make the greatest difference for them? And how do we not lose this moment of opportunity in the midst of these extraordinary times while we're all dealing with the incredible challenge of the day to day, all of the, the emotions that come with where we are as a nation, but how do we not lose this opportunity right now to create lasting and meaningful change for our kids and our families? Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for that, Erin. So, you know, when I think about both of you, I, I got to tell you, the first thing that comes to mind, Yi Chin, when I think of Boston, I think about my early readings of Jonathan Kozal and his work in Boston schools and all of the, the blight and, um, and how the disadvantage was so widespread that it was unbelievable that children had the resilience to beat back some of those incredible barriers that were put before them. And then Aaron, and I think about your work in um, running large systems as well as expanding across the nation, you have also seen lots of need and lots of areas where we could do so much better. And so I'd love for you to share with our audience um, before I weigh in a little bit about just what we see and working on here in Los Angeles, what are some macro and micro areas that we can all make a difference? One of the things that I don't want us to get into a rhythm of doing is always cataloging all the ills, all the things that ail us. I want us to always be thinking about really good solutions. And when I look at this crowd that's joined us this, this uh, afternoon, I see folks who have power at all different levels, vertically and horizontally. And so I'm wondering, what can we start to think about on a macro and micro level that could possibly make some really immediate impact on the lives of the children that we all serve? 
Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a great question. I think in the Boston area, the movement that's really gotten a lot of um, momentum has been around um, behind this, this guiding principle that all children deserve to go to high quality schools, not only just for children who live in communities that can afford them, right? And how do you get to high quality schools? There are so many different elements in it, but first and foremost, I think adequately funding them on the kind of the highest macro level is thinking about how do you adequately fund schools? Um, you know, in, in Boston Public Schools, it, it's, it's interesting. I think it's, you know, I've been in, in education equity space for a really long time. I started as a youth worker in the late 90s working inside of Boston Public School buildings. And, um, and you know, you walk in, the bathrooms have no doors, the kids have no textbooks, and the teachers are running around, and they're really on the front line of trying, while trying to be an educator, a social worker, a nurse, and sometimes a caregiver at the same time. A lot of these can be solved by rethinking a little bit about how do you fund schools and where do you fund. We have schools in Boston area that have school police and no nurses or no psychologists or no social workers on site, right? When the students really, those are easy decisions that you can make to think a little bit about how do you bring um, quality into school. Um, and, I, and I think for, so on the very macro level, I think for sure, adequately funding the school is a great, great place to start and, and also, you know, um, a, a ongoing discussions around that. Um, secondly, on the macro level, I think is, is this culture around standardized testing and how we evaluate the, um, and how that ties to how we evaluate the excellence and potentials of our kids. Um, there has been, even with all the research that's been done about the biases that exist in standardized testing, and somehow we still only lean on that as our barometer of how, you know, much potential these kids have. We on the front line see day to day, you can have a kid that score really low, including myself. I, you know, it took me until a year, you know, 20 years old to graduate from high school. Standardized testing was always a struggle for me. But I also knew the people around me also knew that um, I was more than just my test score. And I think, how do you change the way that our public school education um, evaluate and, and bring out the potential in kids beyond the standardized testing that you have um, is, is a, again, another kind of macro level movement that's been, that's been very strong in, in, um, in the Boston area. And I think on the micro level, I, this is going to sound <laughs> like, this is going to sound like a broken record. I, I believe every single kid in Boston deserves to have a friend. <laughs> that's, and that's just me. I think the idea that you have a caring adult who's not a part of your family, who's not a teacher, whose job is to be in your corner through your entire childhood, how powerful it is. And think about how, you know, the, the trajectory of a childhood that you walk through and how many challenges that you might bump up against, either if it's your family's challenges or challenges that exist in your system. If you always have someone in your corner, that could mean that could, that could be the difference between whether or not your hopes and dreams gets realized or not. And so that is something that I think you know, as you can imagine in, you know, as you can see in the expansion of Friends of the Children that can be done, right? We're already in 22 different locations. Where else can we go? Because I believe every single child deserves to have a friend. How about you, Erin? Yeah, I, it's, um, I'm actually really excited because I think there are so many opportunities, honestly, to dismantle patterns of racism and injustice in schools. And the two that Yi Chen called out were also the two on my list. I think I think where the investments go in the school, um, obviously more funding, but what we're spending our money on really matters. I think it speaks volumes that um, we are not spending as much on support networks around students as we are around surveillance and punitive systems that are designed to punish students. Um, everything from attendance to school discipline, that whole continuum is really built on more of a punitive model as opposed to a support model. You're gonna hear this from me a little bit more today too, I'm sure, but it's a big, it's a theme on my heart and on my mind right now. Um, 
at the at the micro level at the student level i i think a lot because i think a lot about not just um what schools can do, but what the rest of us who care about kids who are school age can do, which is to support that highly individualized and creative and personalized approach to learning. Um, and I think that's a responsibility for sure of the school system that I'd love to see them embrace and think more creatively about. Um, and I also think it's a responsibility for all of us who are part of helping systems that are that that know these kids and that are thinking about them and want them to be able to feel like who they are matters their context their story matters to their ability to to learn and to receive information but also to teach i think viewing students as teachers and having that reciprocity and having humility as 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 adults in these kids lives is really important so i think there are opportunities for not just educators, but for all of us. Yu Chen mentioned a little bit about how friends do this by just creating that larger context, that whole child view for the education system. But every child serving system can be part of that. And I think at a micro level, those of us who care about kids need to lean in there and really challenge systems to do more. I think a little bit about, I've, I've been thinking about equity and anti-racism and you know, equity is so much about that individualization and making sure that circumstances are acknowledged. And then how do we overlay that with this anti-racist lens, changing narratives and, and, and changing power structures and dynamics. And I think there are real opportunities at the micro and macro level to do both those things. I heard something, I don't know if you're familiar with this concept. Somebody was sharing this with me saying that, um, children are like either orchids or dandelions. And those of you that uh, have a green thumb know a little something about orchids, you know that they need the right conditions, they need the right amount of heat and light and, and moisture in order to produce blooms on a perennial basis. Whereas dandelions, they can pop up and spread and they don't need much water, if any water at all, and they can cover a whole yard and make you look, make your angry, it's very, neighbor, very angry with you because you are, ruining lawns all around you. And the purpose of this particular analogy is, is that if children were to be grouped in one of the two categories, we can't have an educational system that treats them all as if they're a bunch of dandelions, that they don't need a much, much resources, they don't need the right conditions, they don't need the right supports, they don't need all the, the very best teachers, those that are culturally competent and reflective of what they look like and remind them of their greatness on a daily basis. And, um, and so it really speaks to the need that we have to think about education as a way of giving the very, very best level of investments and power and strength and support to children if we really expect all of them to get through this instead of just kind of hoping they get through based on the little bit of inputs and supports that we give them. So, you know, what's interesting is that this theme of money keeps coming up in this conversation. And I know that people don't like to talk about money. It's one of the things that ruins most relationships, but we've got to talk about money. And, and when I think about that is that when you think about equity, we have to think about where is money being invested? How are we creating what is called this kind of like social investment society and also dealing with the issue of poverty? One of the things if I don't know if all of you have seen this, but there is a thread, a through line between a lot of the different incidents that we've all seen on the news on a nightly basis is that a lot of the people that are victims of crime and police brutality and racism and all of the other struggles. The through line for me is that many of them come from our impoverished class of Americans. And I think that's something that ought to be looked at. As much as race is something that we need to be mindful of and be fighting, I think there's also an issue of poverty and class that's not been addressed. And so I'd love to see whether or not I'm crazy and just thinking this and share this with you. Do you both, do you see, when you think about issues of equity, do you see themes of poverty and how we are kind of defraying from investing into creating a social investment society? What do you see from your vantage point? Yeah, I think, you know, on, in our city, in, as, as much as Boston carried this, this, um, this ugly history that, that 
you know, still reminds us that we still have so much work to do on a day to day basis. We also are in a city that isn't afraid to say that in order for us to improve education, you have to improve people because people's economic um, situation, right? Um, in at least in Friends Boston, we know the difference between being able to have being able to count on three meals a day at home, being able to count on having, you know, um, money to pay for internet at home could be the difference between whether or not you make it in school. And so you really can't talk about, you know, um, education excellence without addressing how poverty shows up uh, and, and gets in the way of um, young people's ability to learn. And I think too often people look at them as separate issues, right? And then, and, and I think inside of the classroom, they actually collide. And, you know, we know a hungry child can't learn in the classroom. And so um, you do have to pay attention to that. And I think that, you know, when you think about education equity, um, there's the, again, the macro level being able to think about how do you bring high quality schools into every single neighborhood, even the ones that have had, you know, um, have been impacted by generation poverty um, on the most macro micro level is thinking about how do you make sure that kids can show up ready to learn. And I think, you know, um, I know across the chapters in, in the Friends Network, that's a, um, a big focus is thinking about not just addressing um, the advocacy piece and showing up with a kid, but also doing everything that we can to remove as many barriers as possible. Through the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we did weekly meal and grocery deliveries because we know that people have needs. And if, if that's one less thing that they have to worry about, that's one, you know, you create a little bit of slack for them to, for families to remove, to move resources around so that they can pay attention to the most important thing. And so it's for us to really also, I think Thomas, you're absolutely right. It's this holistic view of, of, of working with the child that is beyond the classroom, but also take into consideration of what gets in the way on the day-to-day -day basis. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, this one is, has been a, something I've struggled with for a really long time, Thomas. Um, uh, I think that it's, to me, kind of, it's unquestionably true that intergenerational systemic racism has created economic conditions in this country that disadvantage black and brown people. It's also true that poverty, there is, there is stigma and there are realities associated with poverty that create significant barriers, no matter your race or ethnicity in this country. Um, but I mean, I'm, I, I think that the, I guess I feel like the conversation about social investment um, can't ignore the construct of, of racism and systemic oppression, that has to be either kind of a co-primary or like a very, um, uh, you know, just sort of tightly intertwined because I think that when I go to the root of so many of the systems that are designed, that, that, that people like me who are white think of as helping systems, um, they are not helping systems for my black and brown brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. um, and how they got started was, was not actually, you know, even though on their, you know, just the, the construct in our racialized culture is that they're designed to be helpful. The way they got started when you really dig into it was actually uh, rooted in systemic oppression that was very targeted in certain ways. I mean, I love to talk about the child welfare system for just a minute because I think that, you know, that system in many people's minds is a, is a child safety system. And I don't want to discount the important role that it plays around child safety for some children. But what if instead as a country we were investing in a child well-being system? What if the name was different, right? What it, what it, 
what happens right now when the majority of cases that come to the attention of that system involve neglect, and there was a study recently that Chapin Hall did that dug even deeper, and even the majority of those cases are actually poverty. <laughs> But then you overlay that issue of disparity and race and you see the communities that are most impacted by what is really a surveillance model that is not a support system. It's not a child well-being system. And I think, what if we built something different together as a community? If we were starting now and starting from scratch and the root, the foundation was something totally different than um, what it truly is, which was a humane society model designed around rescuing animals, um, <laughs> which, I mean, if any of you have any curiosity about this, this could be a whole nother real talk, Thomas. Um, but even the education system, which was designed to produce sameness and factory workers and widgets and was only allowed for, and only certain people could take advantage of for so long. And I mean, I think that these systems, what, what you know, I just, I can't ignore, I, I, it's not to say, Thomas, that your comments about poverty aren't super relevant and it, they need to be paid attention to, but I just think it's so important to acknowledge those other pieces. And if we're going to talk about investment, which I really like to do, or even redistribution, because it's not always new money. I mean, I think that's something I learned when I was leading the Department of Human Services for Oregon. We were losing money, but we were making con conscious choices about where the money we had was going to go. We set aside funds for culturally specific programs in that time so that communities could benefit that needed it most. We repurposed our staff to focus on supports and efficiencies rather than you know, cut contracts. I mean, there were things that, that we did that that crisis created the opportunity for us to do and we were by no means perfect. I'm sure you can find me on the internet in a lot of different ways. <laughs> But I just think the way you approach either investment or reinvestment um, is really kind of the conversation of the now. And I can't ignore race in that conversation. Absolutely. No, absolutely. So I mean, before I even go to that, I had another topic I was going to go to, but you're making me pause on that, Aaron. And you can, so I'm going to pause and I'm going to ask you a question that we talked about recently. You, talk, you, you mentioned, Aaron, about uh, transforming the system reforming it or blowing it up and starting from scratch. I, it makes me think of that famous quote by Audre Lorde when she says, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. So if we could reimagine our systems to serve children, and here in LA we're focusing specifically on children impacted by the child welfare system, the foster care system, I think about your work is encompassing all of those communities, rural and city and all of the different subsets of children who are particularly vulnerable for systems involvement. Yi Chen, you have the whole gamut of families and children in your chapter in Boston. If you were to think about that quote by Audre Lorde in terms of come up and coming up with new tools, what new tools do we need to be using? Oh. Thomas, you're going to get me in trouble here. Um, it's just, so I think, <laughs> just the three of them. <laughs> Wait, this is recorded, right? This is going to come back and haunt me. No, not at all. Um, you know, what, what I really love, I mean, what I hated was that, you know, the COVID-19 really exacerbated all the inequities that we had in education. In our City, and, I'm, and I know this for a fact that across the country also, people are turning to the tools of the movement um, in the time of urgency, in the time of desperation, they turn to innovation, right? So you look at the movements of the Black Panthers, the young lords, and how the immigrants also come together in this country, you start seeing these pockets of things like freedom schools that start popping up, right? They go, this is not working for our kids. So we're going to take matters into our own hands. We're going to educate our own kids. We're going to teach them the history that we want them to teach and align everything that they do still to the Department of Education, you know, academic standards. That to me is like innovation to its max. It's people taking the solutions into their own hands and say, we're going to do something about this because we are seeing this as an opportunity. I'm interested in seeing how then these little kind of innovations that pop up then turns into a movement, right? Um, I know that in the Boston area, 
there's been a homeschooling movement in some of the more progressive neighborhoods where parents are pulling them, their kids out of public schools. Um, you know, they can afford to take them to private school, but they choose not to. They say, we're actually going to create our own school and then teach them our way and then through and follow the homeschooling guidelines. So that I think is an interesting movement for us to all think about, right? Is thinking about like, while there are these um, systems that that's kind of progressing and then we're trying to work from within to um, to fill the gap and then to make it better um, there are these emerging systems that's happening in in um, in education excellence that I think is, is worth watching and um, and I think on the most kind of micro level on our end is thinking about you know how do we um, how do we turn and change the way that we define education excellence, right? I see our mentors do this so masterfully every single day is thinking rather than, you know, um, during COVID-19, instead of trying to figure it out, how do you help a kid who is struggling through multiplication through a virtual outing, they turn to project-based learning and the kids earn, gain the same exact same academic skills except they're having fun, they feel empowered, they, pe they feel inspired by the learning that they're doing. And I think that's something that can easily be done and would not require, and you see educators do this already, right? They are rec recognizing that uh, the, um, the, the push and or being forced to teach via remote learning pushes them towards project-based learning and that's a completely different way of looking at how education system is delivered. And I love every minute of it. And I think we should do that across the board. Those are awesome ideas, Yi Chen. Thomas, you got to answer this question too. It's a hard one, all right? <laughs> Will do. Because um, there's so much to choose from here. Um, I think that, you know, when I think about sy systemic change and um, there's a particular article that guides my thinking that talks about, you know, what happens at the structural level, at the relational level, and then at the transformative level, like our mental models and narratives, uh, building on relationships and dynamics of power, building on policies, change, and funding. So I kind of go in and out of those places and spaces. But I think about the, one of the simplest ideas that I think would be amazing to, to work on with a group of innovators and dreamers is to build a family support system that is truly driven by relationship and by community. So not transactional, because I, I think it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of the helping systems that government delivers right now are in, have moved to be entirely transactional. You must do this in order to get this benefit. If you don't, you don't get the benefit. Right, and that doesn't that doesn't produce transformative change for anybody. Right, it might stabilize, and I'm not again. I mean, I, I I'm going to get in trouble too, Yi Chen, but I'm not <laughs> saying those programs don't matter. But I think it's stop, time to stop pretending that those programs are going to be life changing. Um, they're going to be stabilizing, and they're important, and they should be grounding. But the life changing work happens through relationship, I believe. And I think support, like you, you said, Yi Chen, for children and families who believe they have someone in their corner that are building out their social networks and creating the, based on the strengths of their communities, not the deficits, but the assets and the strengths of their communities that are culturally relevant and specific, trauma-informed, I think it would be profound to build something like that. And then to say to teachers, hey, when you have a concern about a child or family, instead of calling child welfare, why don't you call that family support system over there um, so that they can wrap around the family and support the family to be strong together? I think teachers want to do that. I think that I think that it is very hard for teachers who are mandatory reporters and have all kinds of things that are going against them in that space. They don't they and they're not, as you said, Yi Chen. I mean, there's no access to a social worker, a mental health professional in the school, most likely. Um, I think it would be incredible to have a system that the entire community knew they could rely on if they saw a family and child in trouble and the system was truly coming from a place of strengths based support based that families really wanted to engage in and that was highly relational. 
that would and, be and I would I would attest to that, Aaron. I think in, in Boston area, you know, we build very authentic relationship with the schools and the teachers, and you see that um, really activate um, in the way that precisely in the way that you describe, right? Oftentimes, our friends might get a phone call and say, "Hey," from the teacher, and say, "Hey, you know, this child has missed a couple of days of school." We're very worried can you is there a way that you can intervene and because we have the relationship and the school see us as an asset and as a partner and and to be wrapped around these individual family units and these individual children and I, I you know i think in that way it's you know if you're thinking about you know a lot of people say well what does that cost i mean if you consider matching a child with a professional mentor versus the cost of sending a kid into a kid in, and the family into a system that has generational impact for um, years after, um, the, the return on investment is, is a no-brainer. Absolutely. So you want me to weigh in on this. I'll, I'm just gonna share one thought. I, I think of um, the story of the big bad wolf and the big bad wolf it's a great metaphor for, I think, the time that we're in now. If we think about the story of the Big Bat Wolf, two of the little pigs did not build a house on a strong foundation. And I think COVID-19 is showing the very shallow foundation our society has, especially for our most vulnerable communities, our black and brown communities, uh, and the inequities are being laid bare. And fortunately, because most things have been suspended and we're all kind of sequestered in our homes. We're taking some time out to really start thinking about them out loud collectively and trying to figure out how do we fix and start to really get some create some foundations that can weather any potential storm. And so I think this is an opportunity when I think about using different tools. This is an opportunity for us because we're still a fairly young country in the grand scheme of things. It's okay for us to change course and rebuild and rebuild in a way that's sustainable and not just sustainable for a few, but sustainable for the masses of the people that live in the United States. And so when I think about the, on the topic of education specifically and around race and equity, I can't help but to think that it's really easy to treat somebody else's kids if we don't see them as our own differently. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me is the beginning step. We have to create a level of recognition of each other that we have not had uh, in the history of this country. I think we see past one another. We don't really see each other for our humanity until a crisis comes into play. I think the moment of George Floyd gave a lot of people a shakeup because they finally saw George Floyd for the very first time. And I think what is missing in some of these different moments is that the recognition of being able to see each other and connect and really see each other for who we truly are is what prevents us from growing up and maturing as a nation. And so with that said, that's a hard, hard task. And that's going to take some time. And we all have to have um, we got to all put on our running shoes because this is going to be a marathon, as Nipsey Hussle would say. And so now when I think about that marathon, I'm also thinking about what needs to happen in real time. And real time for me is something that can happen overnight. We are able to find trillions of dollars to keep our financial systems afloat through COVID-19. We can find trillions of dollars to fund schools properly. We can find trillions of dollars to provide a free healthcare for everybody. We can find trillions of dollars to make sure that there are pathways into the world of work that are paying wages to sustain a family and to sustain individuals who want to, to live beyond paycheck to paycheck. And we can find the money to make college affordable if not free. And if this is the moment, then all of the growing pains that we're going through were worth it. But I think this is the moment for us to really reimagine what kind of society can withstand the slings and arrows of fortune in a way that we haven't been able to thus far. And so that's when I think about a change, a use of a different level of tools. Um, I think those kinds of investments can happen today, tomorrow, the very next week, whereas some of the moral arguments and some of the, the behavior and the thinking 
that's going to require some time. We have to start seeing each other a little bit closely. We have to start talking to one another a bit more. And then that recognition will happen. And then it'll be a lot easier for us to treat each other like we're friends, we're neighbors, and treat the children like they're our own. I think that's that's how I would answer that question. So if I get in trouble too, then, then there'll be the three of us, okay? So with that said, we're getting close to our time. I want to give the audience an opportunity to jump in here. I've seen some great comments already posted. I just have one more idea that I would love for both of you to respond to and maybe and you know, I'll let you respond to it any way you like. And you know, every time we do one of these real talk sessions, I, I like to give our audience an idea on how they can use their individual and collective power to create the change we want to see. So both of you, Yi Chen first, what are some action steps that you would encourage participants to take to move the ball forward to create a more equitable society around some of the su subjects that we've discussed? Oh, man. Um, one, if you are in a city that currently doesn't have a Friends of the Children, bring Friends of the Children to your city, be a champion, um, and call Aaron. I know that um, should take care of you. I think that's number one. And number two is, you know, I think it starts with, you know, I think Aaron, Aaron you're right. I think transformation happens, any kind of changes happens when there's a strong relationship as a foundation. And I would love if there is anything at all that for all the participants to walk away from today's conversation, having a conversation about their, within their own city, what does the public school education look like? What is the one thing that they can do? Either that they are gonna cast their vote differently or that they will talk to their neighbor's kids differently or that they would choose to volunteer in a different project or whatever that is. I think that to walk away from it of understanding that, you know, really bringing about education equity is not just the responsibility of those of us on the front line. It's also those that, you know, your tax dollars go to fund public school education and therefore you have a say in this. You have, you actually do have a say in helping to change the, um, the circumstances that, that our young people go to school in and, and, and are, are um, faced with. And so that's what I would, um, the two very, very tangible um, things that I think people can um, can begin to to do immediately right now, actually. Those are great. Um, I think about system interruption when you ask this question. So, like, how each of us can interrupt the systems. You know, some of us who are white are benefiting from, and some of us are not benefiting from. But how can we be interrupters? And I think there are places. There are ways to do that that could that leverage the different skill sets and personalities and and people in the room, people in the Zoom. Um, some of us are going to be more comfortable challenging ourselves as interrupters with the stories that we tell and who tells those stories and really starting to change those mental models. Some of us have the opportunity in the roles that we're in to change power dynamics. You know, to give our power away to invite program participants to be the ones in the driver's seat for whatever it is that we're advocating for or with them to, to achieve. Um, and some of us have the opportunity, and I think all of us really do as, as um, you know, citizens of this great country that we live in, to be part of policy and advocacy around the kinds of change that you wanna see. I, I really, I've, I've worked for, I've worked for 15 years in public policy and I always want people to appreciate that the people that you elect work for you. And they do actually listen to you. I've worked in these offices. I've worked with a lot of these individuals. They count how many email they get on a particular topic. They really do. Um, they pay attention. It may not always feel that way because you get the form letter back, but if you're upset with how your mayor is handling the policing system in your city, you need to let them know and you should speak up. Um, if you want more funding for public schools, you need to let your state legislators know that they should prioritize that over other items in the budget that you may not think are as important. I wouldn't discount everyone's opportunity and ability to do that in addition, of course, to voting, but speak up, weigh in. It's, it's with technology now, it's, it's not hard to do. And I think that it's something that we should all be activating around at this moment in time in our history. So I, it is 
we're almost about 10 minutes away. I'd love to give the audience, I've seen some great comments. Thank you for those reflections and uh, affirmations for those of you that are already weighed in. If you have a statement or a question for our, our group here, please, this is a moment to share it. While you're thinking about that and formulating that, that idea, I thought I'd share a little something. You know, in moments like these, when we're thinking about weighty topics, um, you know, historically, the, uh, the artists have always stood up and, and really, you know, helped us keep everything in perspective. And so there's an artist uh, that I think we all know and have come to appreciate that uh, kind of talks about this moment. He kind of predicts that this moment will happen. So I'm going to share that with you in a second. But let's first field one of these questions from Joanna Scholler. Joanna asks, how do you suggest getting board involvement to speak up, namely about local policing, school systems changes, via legislature, legislators, et cetera. Uh, Aaron, Yi Chen, you, we've all worked with board members. How do we get them to be leaders in this effort so it's not just us? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that people gotta start where they are. And, you know, for some board members, they're ready to, to march with you and, and help you carry the other end of the flag, right? And in, in that way, there is a spot for you and, and we welcome you. And, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, Friends Boston's board have done really, really well is creating the space in which these conversations can be had in their own community, which is really powerful. Um, we have our um, director of development here, Stacy. She's like right in the middle of my square, so I'm staring right at her. Um, she has worked with many of our board members in creating very intimate gatherings where they invite their friends and their neighbors so that, you know, where we can talk about these real issues about education equities that doesn't seem like it's just an issue that happens in another community because when you put these voices in front of you, it's no longer just somebody else's issue, right? It becomes more relevant. It becomes something that happens actually in your own living room. When the conversations had in your own living room, that changes the dynamic of how you think about um, what you can do about it. Um, and I would encourage, I think that those conversations, you know, um, this has done always an amazing job of, of um, making sure that, you know, uh, um, the voices of, of those most impacted are, are, are represented. I think that's a great place for board members to start is to use their own home as a stage and invite other people in so the conversations and the voices can be elevated. Thank you, thank you. So let me share, let me share my screen with you. Give me a second here. I see more questions are coming in. So I mentioned a second ago that uh, during tough times, usually artists always stand up and share something that helps keep everything in perspective. And so this is a poem that took me back to my days in, in grad school. And, uh, and I saw someone posted it recently and I know I reposted on my Instagram page and I thought it was really applicable to the days and the times that we're in now. And this is by Langston Hughes. Uh, with Yi Chin here, again, I'm thinking fondly of Jonathan Kozal. He, when he taught, after he graduated Harvard and taught in Boston schools, he actually got fired from Boston schools for teaching this poem. And so I'm gonna share this poem with you. And again, I think it, uh, you see the picture of Trayvon Martin there to kind of set this off. <clears throat> this is for the kids who die, black and white, for kids who will die certainly, the old and rich will live on a while, as always, eating blood and gold, letting kids die. Kids will die in the swamps of Mississippi, organizing sharecroppers. Kids will die in the streets of Chicago, organizing workers. Kids will die in the orange groves of California, telling others to get together. Whites and Filipinos, Negroes and Mexicans, all kinds of kids will die who don't believe in lies and bribes and contentment and a lousy peace. Of course, the wise and the learned who pin editorials in the papers and the gentlemen with doctor in front of their names, white and black, who make surveys and write books, will live on weaving words to smother the kids who die. And the sleazy courts and the bribe-reaching police 
and the blood-loving generals and the money-loving preachers will all raise their hands against the kids who die, beating them with laws and clubs and bayonets and bullets to frighten the people. For the kids who die are like iron in the blood of the people, and the old and rich don't want the people to taste the iron of the kids who die, don't want the people to get wise to their own power, to believe in Angela Herndon or even get tougher. Listen, kids who die, maybe now there will be no monument for you except in our hearts. Maybe your bodies will be lost in a swamp or a prison grave or the potter's field or the rivers where you drown like Liebknecht. But the day will come, you are sure yourselves that it is coming when the marching feet of the masses will raise you for a living monument of love and joy and laughter and black hands and white hands claps as one and the song that reaches the sky, the song of the life triumphant through the kids who die. And so I thought I'd share that with you. I hope you get a chance to, to read that when you get a second. Um, really want to just reach out to all of you and say thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Yi Chin and Aaron, taking a second out of your busy schedules. You know, we work on these things every day, all day. I think everyone on this call, I encourage you to try to devote some of your time and do the same. And then together we can start, uh, like I said, keep creating the conditions for change. So thank you so much for joining us of the friends from the Friends of the Children family, Aaron and Yi Chen, thank you again so much. And uh, look forward to talking to all of you soon in some iteration. Please reach out to Yi Chen, feel free to reach out to Aaron, reach out to me here in Los Angeles, and let's do some great work together. Thank you so much.